welcome to Worth Quoting, a speaker series sponsored by the Women's Center at Florida Junior College. Our guest today is Shirley Chisholm. She's also brought as a guest of the Institute for Private Enterprise as part of the Forecast 85 program. Thank you for coming, Shirley. We're so glad to have you. It's a real pleasure. Until you decided not to run again, you were the senior Democratic Congresswoman from the state of New York, and now you're in another career going around speaking to groups such as the student body at Florida Junior College. Can you tell us a little bit about what got you started and what prompted you to change careers? Well, ever since the inception of my political career some 25 years ago, I always knew that I didn't intend to spend all of my creative and productive years in the political arena. It's a very hard, tough life. One has absolutely no private life at all. And because I'm an activist by nature, I found that even when I was supposed to be away from work, I was constantly involved. I had no time for myself and my family. And uh, when my husband met uh, a very serious uh, accident some seven years ago, uh, which took him out of circulation for almost two years, he was hospitalized for a year and a half and uh, had to be in a wheelchair for nine months and massive therapy for six months. I made my mind up at that time that if indeed he did recover, that I was going to leave at that particular point. And my husband recovered completely. And so I just made my mind up to go home. And I thought once I went home, I would be, have a little bit more time for myself, for him, and uh, be, lead a little bit more of a private life. But it hasn't worked out that way. <laughs> but the most important thing, though, is that I am in control of my time so that I can uh, control the days that I feel like working, the days I feel like lecturing, the days I feel like staying home. So from that standpoint, it's made it a little bit easier for me. Mm -hmm. I'm very excited now. The, they're working on a TV documentary of my life, and that's another new area that I've moved into. I'm writing two books right now, and I'm holding the Purington Chair at Mount Holyoke College, the oldest women's college in South Hadley, Massachusetts. So I'm doing a lot of things. It sounds like you really are. Could you tell us a little bit about the message that you try and instill in the youth of today? Yes. I, I think so often uh, many of the young people uh, do not have enough of a understanding of the depth and the breadth of their own historical roots. And I attempted in a kind of cursory fashion to take them back to the days when our people came here from the shores of Africa right up to the present in order to hope to visually picture for them uh, the, the obstacles, the impediments, but yet in spite of all of that, the resiliency and the inner s sources of strength that the black race has. And I hope that I was able to leave an imprint on their minds and that it would serve them in good stead as their attempt to carry on in the future. Very good. We have a, a very lively audience with us today, and sure. we're going to open it up to some some questions, if there are any. Uh, Ken, do you have a question? Elaine, could you bring the microphone up, please, to, uh, to Ken and let him ask his question, please? Congresswoman, my question is pretty uh, fundamental, if you will. Earlier this week, the uh, President gave his State of the Union address that include uh, a plan that is supposed to give blacks and other minorities some economic parity, but it also includes uh, proposed cuts in uh, domestic programs. What are your thoughts on, on the President's uh, proposals now and the uh, ramifications or the uh, damage, if you will, on black Americans? I think, first of all, all of us have to recognize that the, uh, the debt ceiling in this country has reached phenomenal heights. It has reached such heights in this country that it's going to take our children's 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 children to pay off this fantastic debt. We're leaving this to future generations to come. Secondly, all of us will have to share in the burden in terms of the decimation of this fantastic amount of money that, that we owe. But the important thing is that it be shared equitably, that it be not done in a disproportionate fashion. And what is happening in terms of the President's proposals is that he's not moving in the direction of an equitable type of division of the burden that has to be shared. In fact, if one looks very closely at the package and understands where he's coming from, he is giving aid and comfort to the middle income, the upper middle income, not even middle income, just the upper middle income and the rich people of this country, which is not unusual in terms of what his basic philosophy really is all about. It remains to be seen, however, 
whether or not the legislative branch of government will accept this fantastic budget that he has now sent down from 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. And if one has been listening carefully, one has already noticed that not only Democratic, but Republican senators are saying that that budget has to be changed. So we now have to wait now within the next few months to see really what uh, occurs. There's a question right there, Elaine. Sarah Chisholm, and I'm proud to call you that. Certainly, thank you. My question is much the same thing, and I'd like to have your thoughts on the future of the Department of Education under this administration. Sure. I think one could say now, in terms of the latest enunciations or the latest pronouncements that are coming from President Reagan, that he will not touch the Department of Education. He tried in the last, in the first term of tenure, to really abolish the Department of Education. And he recognized that the Congress was not favorably disposed towards this move, so he gave it up very quickly. Then he had said earlier, later, that he would try to do it in the second term, but for whatever the reasons may be, he said he's not going to touch it. He's going to leave it alone. So at the present, it seems as though uh, the Department of Education will not be cut from the budget. But uh, I know what has happened before in terms of other things that he said that about, and he went right through and did it. So we have to wait and see <coughs> once again. In education, I know you're a firm believer. You told the students at Florida Junior College how important it was for them. Yes. Can you give us a little bit of, of an idea of how you've had to make your own education, in fact, educate yourself for your career? Oh, I, I think it's important that um, uh, students have to recognize that in order to function in a very highly automated and technological society, in fact, in order just to even sweep the streets today or what have you, you need a high school diploma, mm -hmm. that uh, they have to get Make, take the advantage of every educational opportunity they have. They also have to make their minds up as to what their goals or objectives are going to be and pursue those goals and objectives with a real enthusiasm. And don't settle for mediocrity. Uh, some of these students I meet are just so glad that they made it. They're very excited if they get a C or C plus. Uh, strive for excellence. Excellence reaps rewards, and excellence also puts you in the position of being in the top 10% who will be able to get the job openings because of the fact that you're not mediocre. So I, I, I think it's important that the students really apply themselves, they discipline themselves, and they do not permit themselves to be easily distracted from their objectives. Well, you're a self-made woman, I yes. think. Uh, you are not from the middle class. I think That's a lot right. of people might assume that you were. I know. Um, but I think maybe if we got some insight onto your background and what inspired you, maybe it was, I think you mentioned your grandmother, who might have been, mm -hmm. you know, an early feminist who inspired you yes. to, to excellence. Can you yes, give us my, some insight? Yes, my, my maternal grandmother, uh, I think I see her now, she was a Carib Indian. She was about 6'4". You remember her so well? She used to wear these boots that were laced up to her knees, and it would take her a good half hour every morning when she would get up to lace these boots <laughs> up or what have you. But she was a woman that really inspired me fantastically. Uh, she told me at a very young age, like three and a half or four, she, used, she told me, you, child, you have, a, you have a good brain, and you've got to make the most of yourself as you grow up in spite of the fact that you're a black and that you're going to be a woman. So from that standpoint, I say she was an early feminist, she didn't even know it. And she, used to, she instilled in me, not mediocrity, she said, the world is full of mediocre people. And I think this is why I strive so hard and I work so hard, because I wanted to be the best of whatever I was going to do. My grandmother instilled that in me. Moreover, when I used to do my homework and what have you, when I would come home, I would have to sit at the table and my grandmother would go over my homework with me and ask me questions. And if I didn't speak up, she would say, child, open your mouth and pronounce your words. Don't drop the, oh, she was a stickler. <laughs> uh, but it paid off. Mm -hmm. It paid off. And I thank God that uh, I was exposed to that kind of thing. That's wonderful. We have another question. I'm Beverly Jackson, a student at Edward Waters College. I want to say that it is my honor to have you as one of my role models. My question is this, what inner energies drive you, your burdens or your blessings, and why? <laughs> it's a poetic question. Yes, it certainly is. I think it's a combination of both. The burdens from the standpoint of the fact that I know that in this society, being a part of the female gender as well as a part of the black race, that these are two obstacles that uh, cannot be easily forgotten because you meet them in some form 
every day in your life, whether it's a casual reminder or a deep reminder. So therefore, what you have to do, you have to build yourself in such a way that you're not going to allow this kind of burden, if you will, uh, to get in the way of attempting to develop your objective. Uh, secondly, I think a great deal that has happened to me too is that I, I'm a I am a very religious woman, but I don't wear my religion on my sleeve. But my Quaker upbringing has sustained me and has given me the resiliency uh, to continue even when the going gets rough. Last but not least, uh, I have a tremendous amount of confidence in myself. If nobody else has confidence in me, I've got it. And I think that if you, if you know who you are, if you believe, if you know you're good and you feel you're good, and you, ha you develop this confidence in self and you have faith in, in God, it's amazing what you can do. If I paid attention to all the doomsday criers around me as I was bending my way to the top, I never would have made it. We have another question. Congresswoman Chisholm, yes. a two-part question, if you will. First of all, would you comment on Geraldine Ferraro's candidacy? Mm -hmm. And secondly, what would we have to do to entice you back into politics and specifically into that role as vice presidential candidate? Yes, certainly I will comment on it. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, I'd like to make it quite clear that Geraldine Ferraro is, is a very bright woman. She's from the same state as I am from New York, and I know her very well. But right from the very beginning, I indicated quite clearly that the Democratic Party cannot win unless it has an appeal to the Southerners. And I felt that if indeed you were going to put a woman on the ticket, that it had to be a Southern woman because of what had been happening within this Democratic Party. The polls had already been indicating with out Geraldine Farrar being listed or mentioned as a candidate that the South was going for Reagan. So if you're going to try to bring the South back, you have to put an element on the ticket that would help to bring the South back. So if you're going to put a woman, put a Southern woman. And my candidate was Lindy Boggs from Louisiana. And I, I still believe that if Lindy Boggs was on the ticket, the ticket wouldn't have been, I don't believe any ticket would have won with Reagan this time. It's a unique set of political circumstances in this nation. But we would have carried, I think, five or six states if Lindy Boggs was on the ticket. Because Lindy Boggs is a congresswoman that is liked and admired by the conservative South, the progressive South, blacks, whites, and what have. I've watched this as I've traveled throughout the South, how people feel about Lindy. But they felt that they wanted to go with Geraldine Ferraro. And it was very unfortunate that I found, as I traveled around for the ticket after the convention, that the South didn't buy Geraldine Ferraro. It was the North and parts of the Northeast that brought her, but not the South. So that's history now, but one must give her credit for the fact that she was the first woman to uh, be nominated by her party officially to run for the vice presidential spot. So she has, she has that as history. She's made her bit of history also, okay? Um, myself, I, uh, I have no further personal political ambitions as such. I like to consider myself now, after spending 25 years in a political arena, as a, an elder stateswoman, uh, attempting to give to others what I have learned. However, there are people in this country that have ambitions for them. They told me they're going to let me stay in academia for another year, and they're going to come back and get me, whatever that means. <laughs> but, <laughs> but personally, I have no further am ambitions. It is still very difficult in this country if you're black and a woman. Uh, to really move in that direction. Although I know if I did it, I would get greater support because I'm better known now and uh, I would get greater support. But at this stage of my life, I'm not really that interested. Well, Geraldine Ferraro may have made history in 1984, but you certainly made history in 1972. And yes. Again in 1982. Now in 72, you campaigned for the Democratic Party nomination. Mm -hmm. What gave you the uh, inspiration to do that, because you'd only been a congresswoman since 1969, and that was relatively new even f well, for anyone. Yes. Well, I think what really happened there is that people in 25 states raised money for me to participate in their state primaries and caucuses. Now, I mm -hmm. think that a test of whether or not people are fooling with you is when they put their money on the line. Good because time. in the very beginning, so many of them said, surely the ice has to be broken. And you have so much nerve, and you're bright, and you're articulate, 
uh, you have a combination of things. Why don't you be the person that uh, go out there and do it? You can debate any man on any issue. You're very bright. Why don't you do And I remember I, I, I said to them that uh, you can't do it by this moral encouragement. Oh, gosh, lo and behold, in a couple of months in two states, Florida and Minnesota, those were the two states that came through, and I had to make a determination whether or not I was going to run. They raised the money. And the moment I made the determination that I was going to run, I knew that hell would break loose, and it did. Because look at who I am. I am a black female daring to have the audacity to say I would like to be the President of the United States of America. But you said it twice. You said it in 72, and then you did it on your own in 82. No, I didn't run for the presidency in 82. Oh, I did, okay, the story of your eight, this is a, must be a typographical yes, error Yes, no, I didn't run in okay, 82. Okay, good. Yeah, sure, but right. you've written a story. Oh, yes, you've I've written, written a book. And you're going to have this autobiography on television, Tele I assume. Yes, yes. I have, I've written two books. One of them, On Board and On Boss, is my autobiography, and the other book is The Good Fight, the story of what happened to me in 1971 and 72. And I'm now completing the third book, uh, this is a real deep book uh, about everything, my 25 years in politics, and it's called Shirley Chisholm, The Illusion of Inclusion. Very interesting. <laughs> and uh, they're now working on a TV documentary on my life, also to be made into a film a little bit later. I'm very excited. A lot of wonderful things are happening. Wonderful How thing. did you get involved in politics in the first place? Quakers oh, don't usually do that. I know that. But you know, it's an interesting thing that Quakers, I often think of the old line Quakers in this country, Susan B. Anthony and Lucretia Mott and all those persons who were involved in the women's suffrage amendment was in the New England states of this country that the, the Quakers really made this country begin to, begin to come alive into what is right and what is equal and what is uh, justifiable. Uh, and uh, I guess part of the fact that the Quaker religion is a religion that uh, treats both men and women on a somewhat equal plane. There's no hierarchical division, no, there's no hierarchical division within that religion as it is in other religions. And also, I'd always been told that I should become involved in community and civic work. I used to lead people to all kinds of hearings and speak up, and they used <laughs> to try to get me to be removed from the chamber, and I would know my rights and what have you. And I knew Robert's rules of orders, and they would try to use that on me, and then I would embarrass them by telling what page and what verse, you know, I was referring to. And people said, you know, you have what it takes. And it was the people, it was really the people that pushed me out politically. But meanwhile, I had been a speechwriter for 10 years, and I had been learning a lot about politics, just writing speeches hmm. for a lot of these people. But you have, we've got at least two questions out here. Congresswoman, in light of what you just said about being uh, difficult, it being difficult being both black and a woman, would you encourage black women to seek uh, political office? Oh, yes, there's no question about it. <clears throat> black women must seek political office. Politics controls every aspect of our lives in this country. And black women have to bequeath a legacy to their children. And we are cognizant of the fact that for a whole host of reasons that many black families only have one parent in that family, and that family is usually the mother. And if she's going to be able to prepare her children and prepare her children for a future with respect to what the real live world is all about, she has to be a participant in the political process which controls the water you drink, the air you breathe, and all of the things that make life better. So the black woman must run for political office. She must seek political office and give it everything that she's got. There's no question about it. I'm convinced. Okay. One of the proposals to deal with the federal deficit would be to cut back on financial aid for college students. This would make it more difficult for students in certain income categories to get aid. What um, alternatives or advice would you have for black students who would be faced with this, would have to deal with this? Well, I think it's a very timely question because even though the president has made the recommendation in his budget that 32-5 uh, is going to be a cutoff point, I believe, the fact remains that the Congress may not accept that, but they will accept some kind of cutoff point. So we know that it is not going to be like old times Therefore, it behooves the black college student and a lot of poor white students as well 
to realize that there's a possibility that they will not be getting the same kind of grant that they have been used to getting in order to pursue their education. And that they've got to think seriously about other alternatives, other ways of making some money. I would say that every college student who is in that particular bracket uh, should start right now trying to seek some kind of employment for the summer. At least they can get, they'll be able to have a job when they come out during the summer months and save that money for their education. Don't wait until they get out, then start looking for a job because it takes time to look to get a job. So I will think that they should do that. In other words, necessity is the mother of invention. And this time it looks as though college students may really have to go out there and do it because once it becomes a law, if it really happens, I hope it doesn't, but the, the deficit in this country is such and what have that it may happen, that they, you're going to find, uh, in any respect, you're going to find a diminution of the number of students from the lower income categories and the number of minority students who will be going to college or going back to college. It's going to have an overall effect. Okay, another question? Professor Chisholm, yes. as an educator today, what is your message to the educational community as far as inciting, enticing students to come into the classroom and to stay into the classroom? I think my, my most exciting, the, the most important message to get across to young people is that opportunities are there which were not there for generations that preceded them. And that a lot of persons have participated in all kinds of struggles in this country to make it better for them in their current generation. And it's up to them to take advantage of the opportunities that they now have and to get away from this kind of selfish philosophy that many of them seem to have, almost seeming to act as though the world owes them something. And I think it's very important for those of us who are the teachers and the professors to try to inculcate in their minds that we have the tools for you, we have the instructors for you, but you now have to feel and recognize that the goal and objectives are important enough that you are going to make sure that you take advantage. That's all you can do. You can't take them by the hands and take them to every place, but that's all you can do. Do you have the same advice for parents who have children? I mean, I understand the educators and what their responsibility would be and someone who's 18 or whatever. What do you do for the parents, especially the single mother, let's say, who's trying so hard and I, wants it to be easier for her child? I think, you know, the single mother has a particularly unique and difficult burden. In many cases, these single mothers are working and they come home, the first thing they have to do is to make sure the children are home and they have to make the meal and then they have to get ready for the next day. They can't go over the children's homework. with them. It's very difficult for a single mother, white or black, in this country today. But I think, like everything else, everything requires, and this is one of my favorite words, disciplining. If a mother knows every day, and her child understands, that every day between, let's say, 8 and 8.30, that mother's going to find out whether or not they did their homework or helped them or what have you, those children will be disciplined to know between 8 and 8.30 you can't fool around. The mother has to set the guidelines. But I think in our society, we tend, we seem to be afraid of our children. We, we give so much permissiveness. I guess I can uh, say this because I grew up in a situation where there was no such thing as permissiveness. <laughs> you know, you had to do what the older folk did because they said they knew better. I think we've allowed too much permissiveness to get in the way of really helping our children to be disciplined to achieve certain things. Okay, another question from the audience. Congresswoman Chisholm, yes. as an old child of the 60s, you're a hero for me, so it's Thank good you. to meet you. And I'd like to comment about that. I represent the women of Jacksonville through the Mayor's Commission on the Status of Women, mm -hmm. and would like your comments about the lack of heroes that our children have today and how that may affect um, potential leadership, and particularly leadership as it refers to women growing up today. Yes. Uh, we have lack of leadership, particularly of women, black and white, but of course it's much more abysmal with respect to blacks, in the field of the areas that have just been more or less recently opened to women. We don't have many women engineers to put on display yet. We don't have women who've made it to the top on our, our bank presidents that we can say, here's a woman bank president. There are lots of areas we're coming through, but we don't have the role models out here yet to use. Uh, I think what we have to do, 
we just have to keep marching. We just have to keep talking about it. We just have to keep pressuring. And you know as well as I do, those of us who keep pressuring, they have other names for us. But so what's new? Change doesn't come about come about in a society from a bunch of shrinking violets sitting back and constantly whining and complaining. Change comes about from those of us who believe that this is important and so we dare to try to move in a direction. Like, we just have to keep at it. We, because if you compare where women are today, as contrasted to 10 years ago, we've made a move. And I love to look at these women who so often say, well, Chisholm, you know, you've got to understand something. Yes, I am making $43,000 a year today, but the women's movement didn't have anything to do with it. It's, you know, these women, they can do it if they really want to. And I say to them, how mistaken you are. It was the very fact that those women who went out in the late 50s and early 60s and began to create the atmosphere that was conducive to the idea that people must be judged on the, ma the basis of their talents and their ability, not on the basis of their gender, that has helped you to move up. I said, you don't even understand what has happened to you. Uh, but, but you don't pay attention to that. You're always going to have those kinds of things in a society. But we just have to keep applying the pressure. It's one of the instruments that we have in a democratic society. You don't have it in other societies. We have it here in America. Just use it. Well, are you planning on uh, keeping up the pressure? I will keep up pressure until the day I die. I feel that this is a, I almost feel that in a sense it's a mission. I guess it's a mission of my own life. I can stay home now and take it easy. I really can. I can stay home and take it easy and get to follow the uh, serials and the soap operas and find <laughs> out what's going on. But there's so much unfinished business. And life is exciting. I am now 60 years of age, and I thank God that, you know, he's preserved me well, that I don't feel like 60, and they tell me I don't look like 60, and I don't bother with 60-year-old women, so I have to keep young. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I think that's just a way of keeping score, and I know, right. I know that your score is, is, is kept more than an age, and you've accomplished a lot in your life, and I know you will in the future. We're really pleased to have you with us today, and thank you all for being such a great audience and having good questions. And I hope that you've done as, as an inspirational job in other places as you have here at, at, in Jacksonville with Florida Junior College. And I'd like to thank the Institute for Private Enterprise for bringing you here and letting us enjoy you, enjoy you here today. Thanks thank, again. Thanks again. Thanks for being with us.